We didn't, you didn't know you were coming for a biology test today. <laughs> um, thank you very much um, to everyone who's been involved with this beautiful event for inviting myself and, and Dr. Brower. Um, this is, these are topics that are really, uh, we're both passionate about and really excited to, to discuss. Um, I'm going to start today by talking about the facts. The fact is, is that female fertility declines with age. We all know this to be true, um, and yet it often catches many of us or other women of our generation or my generation by surprise um, to what degree that really is true. Um, I'm putting up two graphs here just to kind of give you an idea of, of how significant the decline with age really is. Um, what you can see on the right is that what is the rate of conception in a normal month, meaning one attempt at conception at 22 in the peak fertility years, it's only about 25%. One out of every four or five couples who are attempting conception will conceive on any given month. And that precipitously drops as you get towards the end of the 30s and, for, and the early 40s. And what you also see is the rise of infertility, meaning we define infertility as having tried to conceive for at least a year without success. And so as the rate of what we call fecundity, meaning the number of the attempts of getting pregnant each month, as it takes longer and longer, as women get older, the rates of infertility increase as well. And the question is, why does that happen? So there are really two ways in which age affects fertility for women. Uh, one is that the number of eggs declines. We as women are born with all the eggs we'll ever have, uh, millions of them actually, and we lose them over time, and eventually when someone goes into menopause, we run out of eggs. The other thing that happens, and often the more important aspect of fertility, is the quality of those eggs. And when we talk about egg quality, what we really mean is the DNA that's within the eggs themselves. So every egg, if you remember back to ninth grade biology, uh, an egg should have 23 chromosomes as a result of cellular uh, meiosis and cellular division. That process loses its integrity with time, and so you start to have eggs that have either too many or too few chromosomes. And typically, these abnormal eggs typically just don't work. And that's really what's responsible for the fact that month after month, as women get older, they may not conceive on that first try because the egg that comes out is typically just one that's not going to be able to be successful. Rarely, these abnormal eggs can also lead to miscarriage. Uh, thankfully, that's less common, but it does rise, the rates of miscarriage rise as women age in tandem with a decline in pregnancy rates because of these, there are more and more of the eggs that are available are going to be chromosomally abnormal. And so ultimately the effects of declining egg quality mean the average time to pregnancy is gonna increase as women get older. The rates of infertility are going to increase as women get older. The rates of miscarriage are going to increase as women get older. And thankfully, very rarely, the rates of Down syndrome and other chromosomal abnormalities increase as women get older as well. This is just another graph highlighting the same thing. When we do IVF, um, where we create embryos in a laboratory, more and more couples are still choosing to test the chromosomes of those embryos. Now the sort of funny thing is that you can't test the chromosome of the egg, even though the egg is a major contributor to the abnormalities of the chromosome, because an egg is just a single cell. And if you took the DNA out of that cell, you basically end up destroying that cell. And so we really can't test the quality of the eggs at the egg stage, but you can test the quality of embryos, because by the time they get to their final embryo stage, they'll have hundreds of cells, and you can take a few cells off the surface of that embryo and test the chromosomes of that embryo. And what this graph highlights is essentially, as women age, the percentage of normal embryos, of healthy embryos that have the right number of chromosomes is gonna go down. And that is primarily a result of the increase in abnormal eggs as we age. Now many people will say, okay, we recognize that women get, you know, women have trouble conceiving as they get older, or more women are gonna have trouble conceiving. We have amazing technology these days. IVF is, has improved pregnancy rates drastically. There are now seven million babies in the world that have been born as a result of IVF. These are couples who have been able to expand their families or create families when a generation ago they otherwise would not have. But ultimately, IVF is limited by the eggs that it has to deal with. And so IVF, as women get older, is going to be less successful, particularly for this reason, that the quality of the eggs that are being used decline as women get older. And to highlight that point even more, 
So the blue bars here are the pregnancy rates, national pregnancy rates. This date is a little bit old. It's like from 2014. But national pregnancy rates um, with IVF by age group. So the blue bar shows that pregnancy rates are going to decline as when we get older. The purple bar, and Dr. Brower is going to get into this a little bit more, but the purple bar is pregnancy rates with donated eggs. Donated eggs are eggs that tend to come from young women, usually under the age of 30. And what you see is that pregnancy rates with those eggs are the same, or roughly the same, no matter how old the recipient is. Because what really tends to age is the eggs and not so much the ability to carry a pregnancy. And so when we talk about fertility preservation, which I'll get to in a few minutes, freezing eggs, one of the ways to look at it almost is as if you were, you, a woman could become her own egg donor one day. She preserves eggs while they're young to be able to use one day when she's older if she's unable to conceive on her own. Unfortunately, there's one other aspect of fertility that is affected by age, and that's the egg quantity. And so there's a little bit of a double-edged sword that happens to us as we get older, because not only do the quality of our eggs decline, the number of eggs we have available starts to decline as well. And so when we talk about freezing eggs, the real objective is to be able to preserve a group of eggs that has a higher proportion of healthy, normal eggs than you might otherwise have at the time you're trying to conceive. Um, and so you have, but because we can't test them, you have to be able to freeze enough to feel reasonably confident that there's at least one baby in this group of eggs you have stored away. And you know, 10 eggs from a 32-year-old is not going to be the same as 10 eggs from a 39-year-old, except a 32-year-old is going to be much more likely to produce 10 eggs than a 39-year-old. And so there's this real double-edged sword. Um, we can test egg quantity much better than we can test egg quality. Um, and one of the ways we do that is with a hormone level that's produced by the eggs themselves that tends to go down with age, although it's not perfect. Um, and the other is with an ultrasound. This is an ultrasound of the ovary, and you can look at follicles. Those are small fluid-filled cysts that contain immature eggs. And the more follicles that are present typically means the more eggs that are, are available. Egg quantity is not the whole story, though, and it, this is a very intense graph that we don't have to go into, but ultimately what it's showing is that egg quantity in and of itself does not tell us very much about the ability to get pregnant. Because when a couple or a woman is trying to conceive, what really matters is the one egg that comes out each month. So if a young woman is found to have a low ovarian reserve, that in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that she's going to be infertile or going to have problems conceiving. And this is some of the um, nuances that have to be taken into conversation when you think about fertility preservation is that not everybody's going to be the same, not everybody's going to need the fertility preservation, and there's opportunities here for people to get unnecessarily worried if their numbers are really, really low, um, or unnecessarily reassured if their numbers are really, really high and they're older, that may not necessarily be a reassurance. Um, and so it's complicated. Just to summarize what happens as we get older, to kind of take into perspective, this is a graph that um, a colleague of mine, of mine made, and I love this analogy that the ovaries are essentially like gumball machines. When we're young, they're filled with gumballs, and most of those are good gumballs, and every month one comes out, and the likelihood is it's a good one that's gonna come out. As we get older, there are fewer gumballs around, and more of them are abnormal, so the one that comes out is more likely to be abnormal. Now, in the last few minutes that I have, I wanna just talk about how did egg, now we, talk, now we understand sort of why egg freezing exists, why women might want to choose to do egg freezing. How did it come around? The egg freezing, the way we think about it today, the way we've talked about it or we're talking about it now, is really only about six or seven years old. Um, the process has been around for a long time. It was initially developed for young women and girls who were undergoing chemotherapy where you know that there's going to be an insult to their fertility as a way to preventatively preserve some um, ability to have children later on. Um, as the technology developed, we started recognizing that it could be much, it could be made much more successful. And so there was this real paradigm shift once technology moved away from what we call slow freezing to something called vitrification, which allowed the eggs to be fertile, I mean to be thawed and fertilized in a much more um, reliable way. Um, and so in 2007, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine was not particularly fond of opening up 
egg freezing for anyone beyond the cancer um, patient because it was unclear what the outcomes would be like. Um, but in 2012, they removed this experimental label from it and allowed it to be opened up to many more women. Um, interestingly, the Israeli health ministry sort of beat the American ministry of the punch and opened egg freezing up a year earlier than the, than the Americans. Um, and then just this year, the Ethics Committee of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine came out with a, a long document um, about what we call oocyte cryopreservation. I was fortunate enough to help um, draft this document, uh, and one of the things they say is that they, they say plan, they say to call it planned oocyte cryopreservation, not elective or social, because those can impair some judgment. <coughs> um, but essentially, uh, what I highlighted here is the committee concludes that planned oocyte cryopreservation may allow women who in earlier times would have faced infertility and childlessness to potentially have a child to whom they are genetically linked. And that's really ultimately the goal of what we're trying to accomplish here. Obviously, it has some controversies. Um, this is a quote from this, uh, from this document as well. And one of the things I like about it is that uh, it isn't so simple. There's, there's ways to, to criticize and, um, and critique the process on either side. Uh, and it's something that we have to take as a conversation. And one of the things I love about the patients that I see is being able to engage them in that conversation. Um, there is a lot of, oh, this is, sorry, I'm gonna skip all that. Um, there's a lot of back and forth that has to go into discussing whether or not it makes sense for somebody. What are their numbers? What are their goals? Where are they in life? And that means that it has to be individualized. There's no cookie cutter approach. Um, I took this article um, from 2010, demonstrating. I told you that the Israeli, the Israeli counterparts, our Israeli counterparts, have been much more on the forefront of this. Um, Mahom Pua, Rav Bornstein at Mahom Pua, post published this article back in 2010, encouraging uh, the Israeli government to cover egg freezing for any woman who was over the age of 34 who was still single. Um, and recently, that has been that has happened. So not all of the I don't totally understand the intricacies of the medicine, medical system in Israel. Every time I try, I get very overwhelmed. Um, but I do know that this is from the National Health Red Ministry's website, um, that egg freezing is, is part of a package that can be covered by the government. Um, and so there's, that conversation is happening sort of in a different speed, in a different sphere uh, at my Israeli counterparts. Uh, I'm going to conclude here because I know Dr. Brower has so much to share with us as well. Uh, I'm leaving you here with some photos from our laboratory. Uh, the center photo is what an egg looks like when it comes out of the body. Single cell covered by all sorts of other um, eggs, I mean other cells, sorry. Um, and this is our embryologist, Dr. Ramirez, who's freezing, who's putting in frozen eggs into their uh, liquid nitrogen tanks. Um, should we swap? Let's swap. I'm sure we'll both be available for questions at the end. to outline some definitions. Um, there's a difference uh, between a gestational carrier and someone who's a surrogate. And what I'm gonna be focusing on today is really the gestational carrier component, or as it's being referred to now um, more in the media as gestational surrogacy. So the gestational carrier is a woman who carries a pregnancy for another. A gestational, a, a surrogate, a traditional surrogate, is a woman who both carries a pregnancy and donates her egg, right? So a carrier, in a carrier's case, which is what we do currently um, with gestational surrogacy, is where you create an embryo from an egg and a sperm of third parties, right? Those are the intended parents. I'll go 
into more definitions a little bit later, and you put them back into a carrier. Versus a surrogate would be someone who's using her own egg and getting a disseminated through sperm, for example. Currently, in the current climate, um, a traditional surrogacy is frowned upon um, legally and ethically, and so what we mostly do now is gestational surrogacy or use gestational carriers. So who needs a carrier, right? Um, basically anyone who, who cannot carry a pregnancy for whatever reason. So there's medical reasons that women can't carry a pregnancy. I see a lot of cancer patients who had embryos or eggs frozen prior to their chemo treatments, and now they're coming back um, for pregnancies, and some of them who have very aggressive estrogen-sensitive tumors will require a carrier. Um, there are other medical conditions, things like cystic fibrosis, where it's just not safe for someone to carry a pregnancy, and um, those women will also use, um, will use a carrier. Or many women have had, you know, I hear the worst possible, you know, perinatal stories of severe preterm deliveries or, you know, horrific um, complications, and so a lot of times those women will, will also use carriers. Absence of a uterus, of course, so it can either be congenital absence of uterus, that's something called MRKH, which is when a woman is born without a uterus, or acquired, meaning she had a hysterectomy for whatever reason. A significant uterine anomaly, so if the uterus is malformed to the point where it can't carry pregnancy, um, biologic inability to conceive or bear a child, such as um, a same-sex male couple, which we do see a lot of, or an unidentified in vitro factor, which is basically someone who has repetitively tried and failed IVF with beautiful genetically tested embryos. So medically speaking, doing a gestational carrier cycle or a gestational surrogacy cycle is actually very, very easy, okay? It's really the logistics that are complicated, the logistics and the legalities. There are several members of the team. So first you have the intended parents. These are the biologic parents. I can't say genetic parents because sometimes you're using a donor egg or a donor sperm. So, so they're really, that's why they're called intended parents. Those are the ones that will be taking over the child and taking care of the child. The gestational carrier, um, an agency, uh, there's, there's basically two ways to find carriers. You're either finding altruistic carriers, which means you're not exchanging money for contract. This is a family member, a friend who's willing to carry for you, or you find a third party through an agency, which is usually the safest way to find carriers. Um, I do have women coming to me finding carriers you know, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Craigslist, what have you, but when you have an agency involved, it's really important for vetting the carrier. Inclusive of the agency is an attorney. So most of these agencies have reproductive attorneys on board. A lot of the agencies are actually owned by reproductive attorneys. And it's because when you go through the contract process, the intended parents need an attorney, and they work with a counterpart that represents the carrier. And the agencies are very good at coordinating that. A reproductive endocrinologist, such as myself, and obviously an obstetrician to deliver the baby. So I look at the process really is in kind of three components, right? The first is to create the embryo, the second is to find the carrier, and the last is to set up, set up the transfer. So let's just go through these processes. So I'm sure we have some, some doctors in the room, and this is kind of the basis for everything we do. Like if you understand this, you understand how to freeze eggs, how to do IVF, everything, but it definitely gave me nine years of medical school, and it took me about you know seven years of training to figure out how to distill this down to something more explainable, which I go through with every single one of my patients at a new patient consult. Because I think if you understand this, you can understand anything that you do. So this is a woman's cycle from period to period, if you get regular cycles, like this is like in a textbook, right? So you start off with day one of the period with all these little resting, what we call follicles, which are just sacs of fluid that house eggs. You saw a picture of them um, in the previous talk. And your brain makes this hormone called FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, that does exactly what it says it does, which is stimulates these follicles to grow. So every month, your brain makes this hormone and tells one egg to grow. As the follicle grows and matures, as it matures, it makes estrogen, 
And that estrogen is what's responsible for thickening the uterine lining, preparing it for implantation. And that estrogen also feeds back on the brain, tells it, I have an egg growing, I don't need any more eggs this month, down regulates the FSH, and then triggers your brain to make this other hormone called LH, which leads to egg maturation and ovulation, which means the egg meets the ovary, meets the sperm. Now you have an embryo, and your body makes another hormone called progesterone, which is what stabilizes the lining in the second half of the cycle to now implant the embryo. So everything we do is based, based on this, right? So for example, what is IVF? So in IVF, we basically stop the brain. We don't want the brain to make FSH and tell the ovary to grow an egg, right? We give the patient FSH directly through injectable medications. Every month, your brain only makes enough FSH to grow one egg. So we increase that dose and try to recruit all these other eggs who otherwise would have been starved off. We monitor the patient with ultrasound and blood work. We can actually measure these follicles on ultrasound. We know that when the follicle reaches a certain size, the egg inside should be mature. And we trigger, with the final injection, the final steps of maturation. But instead of letting the patient ovulate, we take them for an egg retrieval 35 hours later. So an egg retrieval is about a 15 minute procedure. Um, the patient's under anesthesia, they have IV sedation, they're not intubated or anything like that. We use a transvaginal ultrasound probe with the needle guide at the end, and we suction out all the fluid from all the follicles, and within that fluid live the eggs. The embryologist then fertilizes the egg with sperm. This happens in the dish. Everyone calls them test tube babies, but they're not, they're dish babies. Um, and, and you can fertilize in two ways. If the sperm is totally normal, you can just do natural insemination, which means you put an egg in a droplet, you surround it by 50,000 sperm and let them do their thing. If there's a major male factor, meaning very low count or motility, uh, you can use something called ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, whereby you take a sperm and you inject it into the egg. But the goal at the end of the day is to get a fertilized egg and it's eventually an embryo. So just to kind of summarize again, you basically stimulate the ovaries to grow multiple follicles, retrieve them, combine them with sperm, create an embryo, and now that you have your embryo, you can transfer the embryo, whether it's to yourself or to a carrier. So this is how an embryo develops, right? So the day after a retrieval, we call the patients with how many eggs fertilized. So, also, so what we really want is what's called a 2PN, a have two pronuclei, so you have a nucleus from the egg, DNA from the egg, and a nucleus from the sperm, DNA from the sperm, and now you watch it grow. You grow it out for between five to seven days, at which point you want to have what's called a blastocyst. So this is a blastocyst. It's an embryo that has two cell layers. The outer cell layer, that's called the trophectoderm, that becomes a placenta, and the inner cell layer, that's called the inner cell mass, that becomes a fetus. So in Dr. Mazel Lerner's talk, she talked about how as we age, our eggs age. And so you're, you're more likely to have an egg that's, that has abnormal chromosomes, which then gets fertilized and leads to an embryo with abnormal chromosomes. So for example, in a 30-year-old, about 50% of her eggs and of her embryos will, will be abnormal, right? In a 40-year-old, it's about 90%. So you can have a really beautiful looking embryo that you want to transfer you don't know whether or not it's chromosomally normal and the likelihood of it to lead to a baby unless you test it. So you can test it with something called PGS, pre-implantation genetic screening. And the way we do that is if you, this is a trophectoderm, this is inner cell mass. Basically you biopsy, you take some of these trophectoderm cells and, and send them off for testing. This is a vacuum, uh, it basically holds the embryo in place. You, you make a, a hole with a laser right here, and then you can suction out a few of those cells. You keep the embryo, you freeze the embryos, you keep them on site, you send the cells off for testing, you get a report back a week later with each embryo and its chromosomal complement, and now you know which one's chromosomally normal and which one is abnormal. And a chromosomally normal embryo that's been tested has about a 65% chance of leading to a live birth. So it's significant. So again, the trophectoderm biopsy, this is just, I had a video, but it wasn't working at home, so I just decided to do this instead. But this is what you're sending off. We keep the embryo on site. Okay, so 
So now you have your embryo, right? And as a part of this embryo creation, there is screening that the intended parents go through before any of this starts. So we have a psychological evaluation that they go through, not to say whether or not they're fit to use a carrier, but really to talk about implications to a child, implications to other children. If you, you know, I see many women who had a cesarean hysterectomy with their first child, so meaning they had a C-section, they took out her uterus because of bleeding or what have you, and now for the second child, they're gonna be using a carrier, so it has implications on the existing child. To talk about disclosing this to children, how do you talk to children about this, that's really the point of the psychological um, aspect. The parents have a genetic evaluation, meaning they have all their preconceptual genetic screening to make sure they're not carriers of diseases that they can then pass on to an embryo because you can actually test embryos for those diseases. They undergo a medical history physical exam, and they also go through infectious disease testing, which has to be very specific timing according to the FDA. So the intended parents have to have infectious disease testing within 30 days of retrieving the egg, and within seven days of retrieving the sperm that you're going to be using to create the embryo. And that's to protect the carrier from infectious disease. So now we have our embryo, and we have to choose our carrier. So as I said, many different ways to find a carrier. We usually recommend, unless it's altruistic family member friend, to use an agency. And the reason is, is because you cannot do an embryo transfer everywhere, and you cannot deliver a baby through a surrogate everywhere, because you won't be protected to make sure that's your baby, right? So there have been many cases, one of the landmark cases you know, regarding surrogacy is in 1986, where a couple uh, hired a woman named Mary Beth Whitehead as a surrogate. They paid her $10,000 in exchange for relinquishing rights, uh, parental rights to the baby at delivery. This baby was called Baby M. It's called the Baby M case. This was in New Jersey. Um, and after delivery, she did not want to relinquish rights. It went to the New Jersey Supreme Court, who sided with the surrogate, and basically um, said that you know it's against public policy to exchange money for contract, and, and it should be her, her rightful child. And New York State followed that as well. So currently, this is a map of where it's safe to do a transfer into a carrier. So for example, my lab is, is in Connecticut. So Connecticut is a very GC-friendly state. You can do transfers into a carrier in Connecticut, right? <coughs> New York is a very unfriendly state. Now, New Jersey was too. New Jersey just changed their law, actually a few months ago, <laughs> very recently. And now there is this Child Parent Security Act, which is up literally in Albany right now, Resolve, which is our national network is trying to get us all to write letters to Cuomo to allow surrogacy here in New York. Um, but it's still against public policy. Basically, the, pa the parents, the intended parents, if delivered in New York or transferred to New York, would, could potentially not be able to claim the baby as their own. Right? And there are people doing surrogacy in New York. And, and there's a lot of people who are saying, oh, what's the big deal? If you have a contract, we'll hold it in court. But it's really not protected for the intended parents, uh, which is why we see a lot of Manhattan patients coming to Connecticut for transfer. Okay, so now we're gonna find our, our surrogate. So how do you do that? If you go through an agency, you basically, the intended parents meet with the agency, they get an idea of kind of what they're looking for geographically and you know, culturally, et cetera. This process takes about three to six months, which depends on how picky the intended parents are. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. The carriers are pre-screened before they ever get to me, so they all have um, medical evaluations, they're cleared by their OB, they have uh, site clearances. Um, once there's a preliminary match, all of her medical records are sent to me to review, so I require all medical records from all prior deliveries. Um, and once she's, she's preliminarily cleared, um, she'll come to our center, she'll fly to our center for a, a, what we call the GC day, which I'll go over in a second. Um, in the case of altruistic carriers, the process is a little bit different, right? If you're using your sister, she's not gonna be, you know, she's gonna be screened by me, not, not go through an agency first, obviously. And what are we looking for? We're looking for women under 40, with uncomplicated pregnancy, uncomplicated medical histories, um, 
you know, our BMI cutoff is 32, which I think is extremely generous. So, you know, 30 is obese, so we'd like for it to be under 30, but our cutoff is 32. Um, you know, a lot of these carriers come from the Midwest or the South, and so, you know, we're kind of looking for, for those, those aspects. <laughs> That's why the BMI is a little bit more generous than it should be. Um, the, the carrier goes through significant screening, as I mentioned, it's psychological evaluation, not only by the agency, but by us as well. Medical history and physical exam, review of records, drug testing, infectious disease testing. And once she's cleared, they come, the carrier and the intended parents come to our center for what we call the GC dates, basically in-person screening and testing. We have a, a psychologist who specializes in third-party reproduction. All she does all day is, is interviews surrogates and IPs. Um, the IPs meet with the psychologist. The GC meets me. We, Jennifer goes in medical history again, a physical exam, psychological evaluation. A, saline, a 3D saline sonogram where we infuse the uterus with saline and three, take 3D pictures of it to make sure it's perfect. And then the GC and the IPs meet together with the reproductive psychologist, which is a very important meeting because you want to make sure that everyone's belief systems and values are in line with each other, right? So things like, are you willing to terminate the baby if there's a significant anomaly? Or, um, you know, you're going to have your three other babies were delivered at a birthing center, but I want you to deliver at a hospital. And if you require a C-section, you need to have a C-section. All these things come up. I had a couple whose GC lived in Indiana, and she was part of this, like, motorcycle team. And with her other babies, she was on the motorcycle at 39 weeks. And the intended parents were like, I don't want you on the motorcycle ever. You know, and that had to be delineated in the contract, right? So these are very important conversations. So, right, so a, if you look at in total of a, a GC from like embryo creation to transfer, it's between $130,000 to $150,000. And most of those fees go to legal and the agencies, compensation of the carrier, which is between thirty dollars and $50,000, taking out an insurance policy through a third party for the carrier for her pregnancy. Yeah, that's the, the, the embryo creation cost if you're doing PGS is between 15 and 20, you know, depending where you go. Everything else is, is it's all logistics and legalities, you know. So 15 to 20 is probably covered by insurance, but the rest is not, right? um, It depends, yeah. right? So like New York's not a mandate state. If it's gonna be in 2020. Yeah. So Connecticut is a mandate state, you're covered for two IVF cycles, yeah. but the rest of it is not covered. So now you have your embryo, it's in a freezer, you have your carrier, you're ready to go. And the rest of the process is pretty easy. The contracts are cleared. We put the carrier on something called Lupron, which stops your brain from making that FSH in the beginning so that she doesn't grow her own egg and ovulate it and accidentally have intercourse, even though it's written in her contract that she won't. Um, because you want to be sure that, that you know that's your baby, obviously. Um, and the GC undergoes endometrial preparation, which means she just takes estrogen for two weeks. That, that beginning of the graph I showed you before where your body's making estrogen, instead of her body making estrogen, we're giving her estrogen to thicken the lining of the uterus and prepare it for implantation. And then we give her progesterone through injectable medication to stabilize the lining. And she flies in um, for her embryo transfer. Very rarely are these women local. So let's say they're living in Dallas, Texas, the agency sets them up with a monitoring fertility center there, and so I'm the one ordering the labs, and they're sending me back results. So like, for example, today, at my any minute, my nurse is gonna take me a picture of an ultrasound of a carrier who got screened in you know, Texas or California or wherever today. If the lining looks good to go, I say, and, and the labs look good, I say, okay, fly her in, we'll do her transfer in six days. So they're on progesterone, they're on the six day of progesterone is when they have their transfer. Um, and basically the transfer is, does not require anesthesia, it's about a five minute procedure. It's done under ultrasound guidance. It is done in our IVF OR, but that's because that's where our lab is. And this is a picture after ultrasound. This is basically, this is the cervix, this is the uterus, this is the lining, and you see it's thick. This is it's a prepared lining. And this tiny little drop you see here in the middle, and you can actually watch it happening. You can see a catheter go in and drop off this little poof of media. And within that drop of media is the embryo. She has a pregnancy test nine days later. And uh, hopefully 
successful. <laughs> we haven't made this happen yet, but <laughs> maybe one day. Um, so, any questions? Yeah. I'm just curious, like, um, so it sounds like all the don't all the um, carriers had previous pregnancies. Yes. What's the statistics on um, on them having miscarriages? So, you know, it's interesting because I so our current success rate for and it's it's a biased success rate. So we're putting a chromosomally normal embryo into a proven uterus is about seventy five percent, right, for embryo trans. With a PGS tested embryo, miscarriage rates are just under 10%, like eight to nine percent. And we see that in the carriers too, you know. Probably less so than our general population, but you know, there's also a whole question of which is a whole other conversation of like reproductive immunology and you're putting it, you know, an antigen at really like a foreign body, is there a chance of rejection, you know, things like this. We don't really see that statistically. But it's a question. So like ten percent, same, same as it's like under, you know, eight, maybe eight to nine percent. Yeah. If it's chromosomally tested, which we definitely recommend if you're using a carrier. How many agencies are there? Many. Many. Anyone can just pop up an agency. That's what so we have to ask. You don't have to have anybody. Any these agencies. Nobody. Oh yeah. my gosh. Right. So and we we have worked. We'll work with. I mean, the, the two of the largest agencies. Right, so Circle Surrogacy, they're in Boston. They, I've never been there. They're like a well-oiled machine. They're one of the biggest ones in the Northeast. Conceivabilities in Chicago, that's a huge one. Growing generations are mostly in California. Um, but there's agencies who, which I won't name, but who have developed quite a reputation for themselves with, with really good people at the top, but they just haven't, so they haven't put in the money to, to get the best product for the patient. So, and, and that's why some of these bigger agencies are much more expensive. They are, but you kind of get what you pay for. This was recently now with um, sperm donors. I think one of the, the freezers that um, read something else. Well, that's a whole other. I know that. But yeah. This yeah. can also, I mean, it can also happen. Be sure it's your. Yeah. But, um, you well, that that thing, I don't know what you're saying. Like, I feel like you, there's a story in what you just implied. And I don't know. I guess it was for sperm Are you talking about the tank failures? The tank failures. Like that so that's for, that was for eggs. And that, that was for eggs. That was for eggs and embryos. Oh, okay. and, but but there was also a recent story of a sperm what? donor that yes. wasn't, like a child conceived from a sperm sense. donor, right. but the donor was not who they thought it was. Oh, that's everyone. Yeah. Yeah. But, I'll okay. yeah. but I didn't know what you were talking about. Okay. So I will tell you <laughs> that, and I didn't cover egg donor, I didn't cover donate, I didn't, so the, other parts of third party production are donor egg donor sperm. And right now, and there's we're going to see this like big time in the next few years, you know, there's a big push for um, open donation and disclosure donations, right? And just a few weeks ago there was um, an ethics conference at NYU um, for third party reproduction and Several individuals came to that conference, angry individuals who are children of donors who were not told. Because what's happening now with like, you know, ancestry and 23andMe and all that stuff, people are kind of able to, to figure things out. So it's, it's actually a very scary time for us as reproductive immunologists, because at the end of the day, you know, we're the one doing the embryo transfer. It's up to the intended parent whether or not they wanted to tell their child. Surrogacy is different. Obviously, I mean, probably they will know, they will disclose. I mean, kids are looking for pictures of their mommy and pregnant, you know what I mean? So it's a little different. So it's, it's an interesting time. I mean, I think our field, more than any other field of medicine, and my, I trained at Cornell, Zebra was my, was my, was my you know, mentor who I keep in you know, very close contact with. He sends me all this actually and he said to me I that when I was a first year fellow he said our field more than any other field of medicine is going to change society and it's true for, for better and for worse you know and we see it now he, 26 year old I've tried for six months I'm not pregnant I want to do IVF with PJ you know it's, it's tough so and we don't do convenience caring by the way just because you don't want care I have patients who are like, I don't have time to be pregnant. <laughs> I'm like, wait till you have a child. <laughs> That's the time to consume. Yes. We 
don't require PGS testing. PGS is a controversy in and of itself, but we recommend it in this case because it decreases miscarriage rates, you know, significantly. Yeah. But we do have people who transfer without testing. Because do we have to, I mean, are you ever able to do a fresh transfer or not? Sorry? Logistically, you would never be able to do a fresh transfer, right? Because that would be missing all. You, I mean, no. We would not do a fresh transfer. I know we're wrapping up, but I, I said I would wait till the end and take questions, so I can take a few questions. Yes. So my question is for you. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about egg freezing and about some of the reasons why we would want to do it, and usually they're health um, um, motivated. Um, can you talk for a moment about what you term social freezing? Um, there, I'm hearing a lot about young women who. I mean. None who are waiting to, I'm just saying who are waiting to get married. For sure. Um, haven't found this right yet, are concerned about their age and eggs. That's and what I do. I mean, 99% of what I do now is treating single women. Like what we call social egg freezing, but what I now call planned egg freezing. I mean, somebody's deciding that I don't, I don't have a partner. Probably 80, I just looked at the data, 87% of my patient population are women who would like to have a child now, but don't feel that they have a partner with whom they could have a family. I mean, they're not delaying their fertility for career purposes alone. Um, and that's what I do. I mean, that is why egg, you know, egg freezing was no longer considered experimental, to be able to open it up to women who recognize that the facts of the matter are that as we get older, our ability to conceive will go down. and there's an opportunity here to preserve the eggs that I have now that have a higher quality, a higher chance of being successful so that should I experience infertility at some point in the future, instead of using my 42-year-old eggs to get pregnant, I can use my 34-year-old eggs. So I, as a follow-up, I know that's not necessarily a fertility issue, which is the main focus of this lecture, but if you can just walk down that road for the benefit, I'm sure of a lot of people here too, because our, in the orthodox circles, sure. I'm hearing this is now being thought about by a lot of the young single women. Yeah. And maybe you can just walk down, what is the process? What are things that they should consider? Is this a no-brainer? Is, is cost a consideration? Or is it a no-brainer? Sure. Your 25-year-old who isn't with someone at this point, sure. and maybe it's with somebody at 30, should yeah. she just hedge her bet and just do right. it so yeah. that just in case she had either a fertility issue or she doesn't find someone who decides to be a single parent. Should, so should at the time we have left, I'll, I'll briefly address that. So I actually, I mean, I, like I, like I mentioned in my, in my biography, like I often speak on various topics where orthodoxy and religiosity sort of intersect with reproduction, and this is a huge one that I speak about. I speak about it all the time. Um, you know, what from a halachic or hashkafic point of view do we see, as, you know, the ability to preserve the future for future opportunities for conception? I will say I have a large population of young, or modern, like modern Orthodox, Orthodox, Yeshivish, Hasidish, I mean, all across the board um, who come to see me, who are typically women in their early 30s, let's say, um, who are single. Um, and I would say that the support in the like, halachic community has been incredibly strong. Um, even more so in the more, let's say, yeshivish Haredi communities where you might anticipate that there would be some hesitation, there has been a lot of support. There's financial support that's coming from that community. There's social and emotional support that's coming from that community. Um, whether it's a, everybody should do it, um, I think in a perfect world, if I said, if, you know, my colleague and I always talk about this, um, that we work together, you know, if it was free, what age would be the perfect age to do it? You know, we can bat around and discuss it. It's probably somewhere between, let's say, 28 and 34 is the perfect age, so to speak, if it was free. But it's not free, it's expensive, and it's exactly like you said, it's not an insurance policy. People like to call it insurance policy. It's a hedge. You're hedging against your bet, your risk, your future risk of infertility, and now we don't have great ways of judging who's going to be infertile and who isn't. It's one of my, like, hopefully professional lifetime goals is to come up with a way to estimate somebody's risk of infertility over the next five years. Doesn't exist yet, we don't have that. Um, 
So you really are, you know, you really are hedging your future bet. But if it, in a perfect world, there is room for someone who might say, you know what, everyone should do this. If you want to have a family one day, you're not capable of doing it right now, maybe this is something everyone should consider. I'm not sure I'm totally on board with that because it is really nuanced. There are some women who are going to be able to freeze four eggs and there are some women who are going to be able to freeze 34 eggs. And who, you know, the difference between that requires a conversation, understanding what people's goals are, uh, where they are in life, where they are in relationships and careers, and all of that plays into it. So it's not so cookie cutter. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. We don't need to take any more. Okay. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.